podcast featuring Paul Lalovic, a renowned business architect and partner at Agile Dynamics. He's also co-founder of Synthetic Equity and Agile Dynamics Tech. Mr. Lalovic, uh, welcome. How do you see the relations uh, the, in future uh, between the humans and machines evolving? Will machines completely take over our jobs? Will do- jobs disappear? Sure. <laughs> Looks like we're jumping uh, in the deep end of the pool right away. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for for having me on board, Tesho. I am uh, uh, quite intrigued, uh, you know, with the future of work, as, as you can imagine, and that's a big part of my work. Um, so um, to very bluntly answer your question, I think, you know, this is, uh, you know, uh, an ages-old uh, question that is always kind of like... Uh, um, cause for fear, concern, but also optimism. So it pretty much like, you know, depends on who you ask. And, uh, you know, some people will say this is going to be the next uh, greatest opportunity for the leapfrogging in the human society. Some people have a fairly negative outlook. But uh, my personal view is that it really depends how this technology is going to be deployed and uh, what are the inputs, throughputs and outputs uh, by people utilizing this technology. In other words, you know, like if you have the greatest solutions, but uh, you use them for not so uh, bright, uh, you know, uh, endeavors, definitely that will have an impact on your on your um, experience. So in other words, you know, even the greatest technology like uh, artificial intelligence, if it's used uh, for the all the wrong reasons in, uh, you know, uh, haphazard uh, ways will have, you know, very negative uh, outcomes. If this technology is deployed as uh, one of the um, game-changing technologies that will advance human society, definitely the future will be bright. But what are some of the transformations and disruptions that we can expect in the job market as these cutting-edge technologies uh, start rolling? Sure, I think you know one of the biggest uh, uh, you know disruptions uh, will be uh, the furthering of the and you know deepening of the chasm uh, between the developed nations and nations that are currently uh, um, you know uh, in the process of being developed. So I think uh, that's that's the biggest you know uh, uh, disruption because the haves uh, will have a significant advantage over the have-nots. And I think that's going to create a lot of uh, threats, but at the same time, a lot of opportunities. In other words, I think uh, that uh, the the key uh, disruption and the key change that's going to bestow this world is uh, the opportunity to change this paradigm, to levelize the ground uh, between the developed nations and developing nations by taking advantage uh, of some of the cost-effective game-changing technologies likes of blockchain. So these new technologies can help the developing countries to reduce the gap? Absolutely. You know, if uh, these countries and people, you know, living uh, in these countries uh, play their cards right, it could be one of those, you know, superpowers they could develop over the time. They could definitely level the grounds and enable them to to catch up. And in some cases, like, you know, even, you know, uh, leapfrog uh, when it comes to the technology maturity. While hosting a conference in Lagos, Nigeria, I had the chance to talk to some of the local experts. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them had the vision of uh, propelling directly from the pre-infrastructure phase into the metaverse. Are there such, le- are such leapfrogs achievable? Absolutely. I think uh, this is a very, very plausible uh, you know, future, especially in the context of the geopolitical shift. So as we have uh, experienced, uh, there is, uh, uh, you know, a collapse of the unipolar world. Uh, China is emerging as one of the key drivers of the technological advancements in the world. And clearly they will have, you know, the agenda um, behind, you know, uh, uh, helping uh, growth markets as well as the developing nations advance their technological maturity and capabilities. So, yeah, I don't see it as something that's that's very far out of reach, where some of these growth markets would benefit uh, from collaboration between, you know, some of the most advanced technological nations and uh, their massive uh, growth markets. Now, going back to the organizational level, What are the strategies that the organizations can employ to adapt to these changes? Well, I mean, that's a very, you know, uh, uh, broad question. But um, 
from my humble view that the key thing is uh, to continuously uh, make sure that you have the best and brightest minds within your organization, as they say, you know, make sure that you have, you know, uh, smart people in the room and pretty sure they will do something uh, uh, intelligent. So coming back to that point, uh, what can be done is uh, falling into uh, three major categories. Number one, they have to make sure that they are not risk adverse. So taking chances, experimenting and taking calculated risks because, you know, the biggest risk is not taking any risks. So um, the second bucket I would talk about is to make sure that you uh, continuously engage and reward the performance within the organization because no innovation will come, you know, if people are not fully committed, engaged, and most importantly, inspired and incentivized to do the right thing when nobody's watching. And the third thing that will string it all together, pay close attention to your leadership effectiveness. Any organization that has an ambition, you know, to weather the storm or to really change the world they operate in has to have leadership that is capable in terms of the foresight, uh, their breadth and depth, and most importantly, high level of empathy to understand how to deploy their emotional intelligence to the best of the outcomes. In certain industries, uh, there might be a scenario where there will be a high demand for certain very special, uh, for certain very specialized and difficult to find occupations, while some of the uh, other existing roles might experience instability. How do we tackle with that? Well, that's very typical because uh, the, the technological as well as the business advances are not necessarily linear. So uh, at the same time, you will have a different pace of the advancement and maturity in different uh, regions, geographies, as well as uh, industry sectors. So that will create that disparity and it's uh, mm -hmm. very common um, especially in today's markets uh, where you would have, you know, a surplus of, uh, of job vacancies as well as a high unemployment rate. So the best way to tackle this is, um, you know, uh, continuous learning. You know, there is no shortcut. As I uh, always say, you know, uh, you have to work on yourself uh, as an organization. You need to continue investing in training and development and making sure that your people are equipped uh, for the next, you know, uh, uh, storm. And uh, these things uh, do not happen naturally. You need to plan, you need to uh, uh, put the resources in terms of the time, expertise, and uh, finance to make sure that you have the right skill sets at the right time in the right place. So yeah, learn, learn, learn. Uh, okay. How will the AI change the workplace culture? Yeah, I mean, like we touched on this question initially in our conversation. So uh, AI ultimately, and you know, please don't quote me, is uh, is essentially going to be a really, you know, uh, 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 great uh, uh, solution and tool in the right hands. But it can be, you know, a very, you know, uh, uh, destructive force, you know, managed by people that don't necessarily you know, put the, the, the right, you know, uh, use uh, uh, behind this uh, solution. So how it will change ultimately is going to depend on the, you know, uh, people behind this uh, solution. You know, it might be a very positive, very creative force. It might be very destructive. Um, I think it's definitely going to be a learning curve. Um, as with every new technology, there will be a period of time of hype, you know. Uh, people will try to attribute, like, you know, supernatural powers to AI. And then eventually this will levelize. People will realize that they cannot solve all the world's problems with AI, that they will have to, you know, put some uh, additional uh, effort uh, from their side. And I think, you know, over that period of time, it will really crystallize the picture of what are the best use cases for AI, what are the most commercially, you know, uh, uh, you know viable cases. But most importantly, what's really going to come down to it, what are the ethical cases for using AI? You know, because at the end of the day, you know, uh, uh, outsourcing a decision-making process is not necessarily something that would uh, bring a great deal of value because, uh, not necessarily that uh, you will uh, be able to displace, uh, you know, the decision making process per se, um, you will be able to displace the accountability. And that's something like, you know, that uh, I believe is, is a really an interesting conversation that warrants like, you know, a deeper thinking. And in other words, you know, for any outcome, you can't just blame the machine. 
there has to be a physical individual behind that decision that should be held accountable. So hiding behind the machine, like, you know, is one of the, you know, uh, bigger challenges that I foresee. It's not necessarily that, you know, robots are going to switch and flip like, you know, in a, like in a Terminator movie. I think it's actually the people that will do some, you know, uh, <laughs> crazy stuff uh, trying to hide behind the machines. So after... Uh According to the Gartner uh, hype cycle, uh, developed in some of the reports of Gartner, this I, uh, hype uh, kind of veins down. Uh, there, there will be actually the crystallization of what use cases are sure. there sure. as applicable. Sure, yeah. I mean, like that's, that's pretty much uh, what I just suggested, you know. So uh, as any technology, you know, uh, this is uh, something novel. There are a lot of, like, you know, unknowns. People get excited. But as with everything else, you know, this excitement eventually levelized, you know, to a certain, you know, uh, uh, realistic levels. And then, you know, there is another cycle of hype that is that is going to follow this. In a book that you are currently writing, you have uh, dealt a lot with the idea of the fusion teams. Uh, what are the benefits of breaking down organizational silos to cross functional teams and how does that uh, enhance operational efficiency in the teams of productivity speed quality and cost effectiveness sure so yeah i mean like this is the book that we are collaborating on and we also have uh, uh, two uh, colleagues uh, helping us out yes. um, Ivan Bilayats as well as uh, Emilia Vukovic so yeah it's it's definitely a showcase uh, for the fusion team so uh, if you look at this uh, collaboration and how we developed the book everybody brought their own perspectives everybody brought their own superpowers to this particular project and that's what made it successful uh, I believe like you know at least uh, in our uh, eyes and, uh, you know, I guess the, the, the market will, will have its own judgment. But what was the whole idea behind this uh, collaboration was uh, to bring people with different perspectives, different point of views, and then to create something that is going to tackle an ever, you know, uh, uh, lasting question, you know, what the future beholds when it comes to jobs. So uh, coming back to the fusion teams, I believe the, the, the future is going to focus on fusion teams, which are teams of, uh, you know, uh, people with different skill sets, different mindsets, different perspectives, because that will ultimately drive the productivity and innovation, you know, uh, silo mentality, you know, uh, uh, bubble, you know, uh, uh, thinking is, is clearly not something that is uh, uh, going to yield the best results. Uh, the teams of the future will have to be smaller, they will have to be more versatile, more agile. So, um, yeah, I definitely believe that's the way of the future because uh, ultimately the teams with a smaller footprint, smaller operating costs and no bureaucracy will definitely yield better results. But how do you apply that to the large organizations? So basically, you know, even the biggest uh, organizations are actually an amalgamation of the small business units. So essentially what you're going to be doing is, uh, you know, uh, bringing together a large number of fusion teams into a larger network. So it's basically a textbook network uh, factor where you're going to use the technology, advanced methodologies when it comes to collaboration and work to enable large number of teams to work together towards the common mission, vision and values. So I don't think it's really going to come down to a... Uh, a, a very, you know, uh, a new and novel way of getting things done, it will be different. So rather than to set up the organization top down, it actually opens doors for setting up organization bottom up. So as the fusion teams, the small organizations become more successful, they will naturally realize the opportunity in working together and collaborating. And that will eventually scale and that will create these uh, super, you know, uh, companies that could actually, you know, be much larger than any corporation known to date. How do fusion teams offer autonomy and responsibility to team members compared to the traditional bureaucratic structures? So essentially, the key, the key to a, a successful fusion team is accountability. So um, if you look at examples, you know, throughout the history, you know, fusion teams likes of, you know, like uh, pirate ships, you know, would have a great deal of accountability. You couldn't really escape, uh, you know, the fact that you have delivered or not delivered, you know, in a very transparent uh, environment where everybody has a particular set of uh, activities to deliver to the 
collective uh, success. And, you know, if you were not in the right place at the right time doing the right thing, it's very apparent. And you are held accountable, you know, to detriment, like, you know, of the of the individual. So uh, the same thing applies even today. What's really important and what's really going to make a huge difference is that the collective keeps individual accountable for the for the for the team success. And that's what typical bureaucratic organizations are very good in evading, hiding and uh, pretty much like, you know, uh, overlooking. How does this autonomy foster innovation? Well, ultimately, <clears throat> what's the, the biggest uh, uh, inhibitor of innovation is a group think and uh, lack of appetite for risk. So uh, what the fusion teams uh, typically deliver is that uh, diversity of thinking and, uh, and uh, you know, a fairly high uh, level of appetite for risk because... Uh, Every individual is stimulated uh, to deliver in order to reap the benefits uh, on their on their level. So that's how, at least, like you know, uh, uh, most of the fusion teams uh, known to date would outperform when it comes to innovation. How does the agile culture within fusion teams enable them to adapt quickly to the changes in work environment? Why is the culture here crucial? Well, culture, you know, is is definitely one of the key success factors of any organization. And what really stands out here is uh, the whole point of being very, you know, quick to to um, you know adopt the, the the best practices when it comes to work, when it comes to thinking, when it comes to delivery, and that level of agility uh, drives the results. Um, you know, as humans, when you really look uh, throughout the history, it's, uh, you know, uh, the evolution of the fittest, you know. So if you were not uh, quick to adopt to the new environment, you would be displaced uh, by the species that are. So same thing happens within the organizational setup, within the business setup and historical setup. Even societies, you know, that uh, were, you know, very adverse to innovation and agility are nowhere to be found on the map. So I guess what the the, the history shows us, uh, durability is driven by agility. A lot of these agile methodologies were uh, created for tech companies, but how do you apply that to the something that is non-tech environment in a more stable? Sure. Sure. I mean, like at the end of the day, that's also a debatable, you know, question like, you know, uh, who invented uh, Agile, uh, you know, I think tech companies contextualized the Agile uh, way of working. They did not necessarily um, invent it, but um, how do you uh, bring it into the more traditional uh, um, work environment is pretty much going to be driven by the ambition of the leadership of that organization. As I have suggested earlier in our discussion, it really comes down to the appetite for risk. Um, there is no linear way of, of driving the change. You know, this is always thought with, you know, a trial and error. And uh, the way you bring it is obviously going to start with, with proof of concepts, experimenting, you know, learning from your own mistake, and most importantly, contextualizing this approach to your own environment, uh, your own, you know, uh, a backdrop in terms of, you know, uh, geography, uh, industry setup, uh, financial resources, and most importantly, uh, skill sets. One of the chapters in the book is named uh, Why the Mafia Doesn't Need HR. Uh, what can business organizations learn from the human HR practices employed by mafia? If there is a, <laughs> such a thing, you know, because it sounds actually strange. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, like, uh, that was a very catchy title that we adopted and uh, it was uh, based on the, on the point of view paper we published uh, uh, a few years back, but the concept is very straightforward. Essentially, people management practices need to be owned by the line. In other words, the business management needs to take full accountability for, for people management practices. So the, 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 the challenge that we foresee in organizations that have a very traditional human resources management practices is that disconnect and silo that is uh, uh, driven by, you know, expecting that somebody else will manage people on your behalf. Be it on a very simple level, you know, from, you know, uh, um, 
human resources services to talent management. Uh, in today's day and age, you know, you can definitely all the transactional services manage uh, via platform or your human resources management system, ERP system of choice. And all the advanced HR solutions need to be managed by the business and the line. That's pretty much like, you know, what's going to define a successful organization because it will remove any uh, chasms between people management practices and line. Uh, you will have a full ownership and accountability of the business. <coughs> and most importantly, nobody knows people better than their own uh, uh, team leaders. So that's that's how it works. Besides mafia, one of the other colorful analogies in the book is the pirate ship. How does the pirate model disrupt stagnation and promote continuous innovation through incentive-based equity approach? And how does that address the issue of favoring longevity over the value contribution? Oh, man, that's a loaded question. <laughs> yeah, it is. I should have split it up into several no questions. No worries, man. So, so, again, you know, I don't want to sound like that we have you know, put a focus on, on a criminal organization <laughs> when we did the research, which was not a fact. Basically, we were looking for the high-performing organizations, and that was the after fact. You know, when we start looking in the high-performing organizations, you know, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, organizations like of pirate ship popped up. So what really makes a difference there is the clarity of mission, you know. So what the pirates are notorious for, you know, is that they are very clear in terms of like, you know, their mission, vision and values. So the whole organization from top down understands clearly what needs to be done and how this needs to be executed. So that's something that uh, forward thinking organizations should adopt. You would be shocked how many modern day organizations are completely clueless in terms of what their leadership expects versus, you know, uh, what the operational staff is, is, uh, is doing. So that disconnect uh, at each uh, level of the organization creates, you know, confusion, uh, brings uh, the tension and ultimately, you know, leads to underperformance. So that's something that is not going to be tolerated on a pirate ship, you know. So we work together and succeed as a team or we fail as individuals, you know. So that's, that's the writing on the wall. So what brings the longevity to, uh, to uh, fusion teams is ultimately going to be their success uh, rate, you know. So what keeps you afloat? You know, the fact that you are outperforming your competition, that you have proven in the market, the fact that you are indisplaceable due to the fact that you bring the continuous value at the right uh, commercial level and that you are making and placing the right bets when it comes to the future. So that's pretty much what defined uh, the successful pirate ship, and that's what defines the successful organization today. But how do you balance the immediate task with the long-term goals? Well, you know, there has to be a degree of foresight in terms of, you know, where are you uh, planning to, to land as an organization? Again, you know... Um, that's that's always uh, uh, easier said than done. So what really comes down to is uh, making sure that you uh, have a very clear mission and vision of your organization, and that's going to be backed by the strong values. So essentially, what's really the key to success here that at any given moment, your organization is making the right decision based on the set of values, while at the same time understanding the big picture. And the key to this is going to be the communication and ability of the leadership to articulate the messaging in a very concise, very pragmatic, and very visually appealing ways so everybody throughout the structure is clear on what's expected out of them to drive the value. How do you envision the future of employee rewards and performance management system in the light of ongoing digitization of work? Sure. So. Uh, What's, what's really going to make and uh, break the, the rewards and incentives in the uh, next few years <coughs> Sorry, is the ability to connect the outcomes and the value creation with the rewards. In other words, it has to be performance-based. You know, one of the biggest uh, drivers of disengagement is the fact that for the same amount of work and effort, somebody else is uh, getting paid more. And that will turn off like, you know, even the most enthusiastic and engaged employee. So what really is going to make a difference is uh, uh, utilization of, you know, uh, technology to enable employees to see how their hard work and innovation 
converts into value for themselves. In other words, how do you articulate that key question? What's in it for me? And as long as people understand that they are going to be the key driver, as well as their team members' uh, collaboration to their individual success, that will, that will be the, the key difference. Can these organizational models that we talked about uh, contribute to the development of sustainable economy that is not reliant on a, uh, state tax subsidies or supranational mandates? Yeah, absolutely. That's the whole idea, you know, because at the end of the day, this uh, day and age empowers people to really become uh, productive regardless of their physical location. You know, we have seen that over the last uh, several years, you know, especially, you know, right after and during the pandemic that, you know, virtual and remote work is uh, becoming much more prominent. And at the same time, we are recognizing that even the global job market is getting fully levelized. So highly sought for skill sets, regardless of the country you live in, are going to be paid like, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, high disparity. So um, I think uh, at the end of the day, the technology will uh, bring the world much closer than, than, than we think. So that means that in future, talent will be the most valuable and the most limited resources that the country can have. Hey man, like talent has been the most valuable and the, the most precious resources dawn of time, you know. So if you really look throughout the human history, the top talent always congregated uh, to, to the centers of gravity, you know. So at some point that was Rome, then, you know, it was uh, uh, New York and, you know, uh, today it might be Shanghai. So. Uh, Talent uh, flows are very much uh, driven by the by the attractiveness of the economy that the particular region creates. So yeah, uh, one of the issues causing the uh, development gap that we talked about before is the lack of uh, access to affordable education. Can technology now help us fix that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that academic uh, uh, institutions are long overdue for, for disruption. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a writing on the wall that the academic system is not necessarily very relevant to today's day and age, and especially in terms of, you know, uh, uh, preparing uh, young uh, people to a world that they will live in. <coughs> so... Uh, Clearly, the, the technology is going to empower that way of changes that will hit the, the academic institutions, hopefully sooner rather than later. And ultimately, yeah, I think uh, the, the cost of education needs to be brought down to, to much more manageable levels. I think uh, the technology holds a key to it, you know, by having the remote, uh, <coughs> sorry, learning opportunities, e-learning, as well as uh, different ways of sharing the content should empower uh, professionals around the world to acquire the right skill sets in order to prepare them for the commercially viable future. And also, uh, there is a place there for the companies to make long-term global investment in, innovation, in education in order to foster the innovation in future. Absolutely. I think that's the key. And I think uh, education without any uh, political strings is going to be the future, you know, because if you really look at uh, the, the landscape of the universities today, uh, more often than not, you would find that they are breeding ground for the political agenda rather than... Uh, you know, uh, uh, learning institutions. And I think that's one of the shifts uh, that will uh, clearly shift the, the paradigm in the right direction where the education is not going to be delivered with, uh, with uh, strings attached to a political agenda. And that will help, uh, you know, the world actually uh, uh, drive the meritocracy, you know, because it's really not going to come down to, you know, uh, what your, you know, set of beliefs is, is driven by or, or paid by somebody. It's really going to come down to your ability to drive the value. As a business architect, how do you see a blockchain changing the business models in future? Tremendously. I think uh, the whole concept of, uh, of uh, decentralization is, uh, is hugely valuable for the business. I think uh, centralization has, you know, uh, proven over the history as, you know, a failed model on every level. And I think uh, that at the end of the day, blockchain has a much uh, higher value 
on the methodological rather than technological level. So it's the mindset shift that will drive the change and the best outcomes, not necessarily the technology uh, itself. So how it will change, you know, it will uh, drive the decision making uh, to the to the ground level. Basically, it will uh, be driven by the consensus rather than, you know, by the central power. It will empower people to really track and to uh, make uh, uh, all the activities as transparent as, as it gets. So uh, accountability will be furthered as well because you will be able to audit and to validate uh, actions uh, by the stakeholders on the chain. And most importantly, it will uh, drive the cost effectiveness of the technology to the level that it will make it available in the growth markets that hold the biggest uh, potential for the for the transformative, you know, uh, future. How does the evolving psychological contract between the employers and the employees shifted away from job security and loyalty towards commitment and self-development? Sure. So, I mean, that's that's pretty much the writing on the wall. As I have mentioned, you know, companies and organizations are failing in answering that, you know, uh, critical question, what's in it for me? So, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So I think... Uh, younger generations are moving away from this, uh, you know, concept of lifelong employment, job security. They realize that basically they cannot trust anybody except themselves and their skill sets and their ability to drive the value. So I think this is just pretty much like, you know, the result of self-realization of how the world operates. So beside like, you know, the, the, the pamphlets as well as like the posters you're going to find on the, on the walls of the corporations, um, it's very little that has been done to, to ensure the right outcomes for the employees. And at the end of the day, at the first whim of the markets, people are displaced from their jobs, that they are let go. And, you know, people are not stupid. They realize these things. And more and more, they're becoming more self-focused and self-centered for the, all the right reasons and uh, trying to figure out how to secure their future by becoming more relevant and uh, uh, able to drive the value from their single point. Besides the rewards that you mentioned, another thing that an organization can do is promote a healthier work-life balance for their employees. How do you do that? Well, it all depends, uh, you know, what the ambition is. Um, more often than not, from my perspective, what I have seen when it comes to these uh, initiatives uh, to, uh, you know, reduce the work hours, that was always done on the on the on the back of a much more sinister agenda where you would introduce the co-employment where you would reduce the salaries and you would essentially start uh, minimizing uh, the opportunity the earning opportunity for the employees and in other words nobody's going to give you the same salary for 3 day uh, work week so what the employers are doing essentially under the banner of you know work life balance they're reducing your income. So uh, that's not the way how it should be. Um, the way um, typically I expect uh, to, to drive the, the, the work-life balance is by uh, shifting uh, towards the, the variable pay that is very much uh, uh, directly a co-measurement of the outcomes. So performance-based pay uh, with the clear-cut expectations, performance measures, and uh, expectations. Uh, that will uh, enable employees to pretty much like you know manage their own time so essentially what i'm trying to say here the best way in my humble view to manage work-life balance is uh, to push the accountability to the employee so for all eyes care like you can work like you know five minutes you can work like you know uh 500 hours what really counts is the outcome my job is to provide as you know employer as a partner in the organization to provide all the necessary support but at the end of the day, the outcomes is something that I need to hold accountable every and each team member. And that's one of the keys to the well-being at work. Well, you know, it's definitely going to enable some of the high performers to spend more time, you know, on uh, leisure and family, uh, while some people will have to invest and perhaps like, you know, they will have to realize that it is a journey. So uh, by the time 
you uh, build the necessary skill sets by the time you build the necessary support capabilities required for you to deliver the expected outcomes it might necessarily be the right balance for you in other words you have to like you know pay it forward you need to invest your time expertise and uh, learn before you can reap the benefits of having like you know the luxury of work-life balance